In 1986, the Netherlands introduced Flevoland as its 12th province, not by reshaping land or taking from neighbors, but by reclaiming it from water. Enter the Markerwadden, a man-made Dutch island chain bursting with life. Birds like geese, plovers, terns, and flamingos thrive here, while the waters host avocets and long-tailed ducks. Yet, just eight years ago, this vibrant ecosystem didn't exist, it was open water in Markermeer, a man-made lake west of Amsterdam. In 2016, dredging ships began transforming 3,200 acres of lakebed into this artificial archipelago, one of Western Europe's largest projects. The aim, to restore nature, reverse environmental damage from dams built in 1932, and create a sanctuary for wildlife and visitors. Experts hope the islands might even improve water quality by trapping sediment, though this remains unproven. The Marker Wadden Archipelago isn't the only man-made part of the Netherlands. A thousand years ago, much of the western region was a vast swamp, while the east featured sandy heaths and pine forests. The Netherlands was incredibly damp, with conditions far from ideal for living. It wasn't until the 20th century that about 640 square miles of land were reclaimed from the water, as shown by the colored areas on modern maps. The Dutch have battled water for over 2,000 years. Early settlers, the Frisians, built artificial mounds called turpen to protect their land. By the 15th century, windmills helped drain dangerous lakes that frequently flooded homes and eroded land. One such lake, Harlemer Mare, dubbed the Water Wolf for its destruction, was eventually tamed. Today, Schiphol Airport stands where the Water Wolf once raged, a testament to Dutch ingenuity. With steam-powered pumping stations, the Dutch revolutionized water management, draining larger lakes like Harlemer Mare. By 1852, the Mermier area was reclaimed, followed by the Weeringer Mere in 1930. This relentless effort created polders, drained coastal lands used for farming, which now define the Netherlands. With around 3,000 polders, they make up nearly half of northwestern Europe's polder land. Managing this artificial landscape falls to water boards, an institution dating back to the 12th century. These boards, the Netherlands' oldest democratic bodies, still operate independently, holding elections and levying taxes to control water levels. Why does the Netherlands reclaim land near water? Two key reasons stand out. First, much of the country sits below sea level, with about 27% of its land vulnerable to flooding. The Netherlands has 280 miles of coastline along the North Sea, where the Rhine, Skelt, and Meuse rivers converge. Without its system of dams, dunes, and pumps, up to 65% of the country would be submerged at high tide. This poses a significant risk since over 60% of the population lives in these low-lying areas. The second reason is a lack of space. Over 80 years ago, concerns about food security pushed the Netherlands to expand farmland by draining wetlands. Memories of the 1944-1945 famine, which claimed up to 25,000 lives, drove the Dutch to prioritize agriculture. Even tulips became a symbol of survival during this time. When food was scarce, tulip bulbs, with more calories than potatoes, provided sustenance. Recipes for tulip-based soups, pancakes, and coffee substitutes helped many endure those desperate times. Just 10 minutes from Amsterdam lies open polderland, once part of the sea. Reclaimed in the 1960s, this serene area is dotted with quiet towns, quirky windmills, and canals. These windmills, originally used to drain marshes, were later repurposed for grinding grain. Among the polders, Weeringermeer stands out. Once dry land around 1000 AD, it became a floodplain after storms in the 1100s. Drained in 1930 as part of the Zuiderzee project, the soil required desalinization before becoming usable farmland in 1934. Four villages were established here, and Weeringermeer became independent in 1945. However, during World War II, retreating German forces flooded the area, submerging over 49,000 acres of farmland. Thankfully, no lives were lost, and the land was drained again. Today, Weeringermeer thrives on farming, producing potatoes, grain, sugar beets, and supporting livestock. Light industry also plays a role, ensuring the polder fulfills its agricultural purpose. The second polder, Nordus Polder, is a municipality of 50,500 residents covering 177 square miles. It's one of the largest in the Netherlands, yet it didn't exist until September 9, 1942. However, the first rye harvest was collected here in 1941. Water levels are still carefully managed, as most of the land lies below sea level, requiring dams, sluices, and pump stations. When the area was drained, strict criteria determined who could settle there. Only those deemed capable of thriving were granted farms, homes, or jobs, with the government playing a significant role in shaping the new society. 
Next is Flevopolder, the world's largest artificial island, covering 375 square miles. Created between 1919 and 1986 through an elaborate system of dams and land reclamation, it's unique for being completely surrounded by lakes. It became the 12th Dutch province on January 1, 1986, after merging the southern and eastern parts. Before this, the Zuider Zee, an inland sea that caused countless storms and disasters, had to be drained. Plans to separate the Zuider Zee from the North Sea date back to the 17th century, but were unfeasible at the time. After enduring floods for centuries, the devastating January 1916 flood, caused by high river levels breaching the North Holland coastline, resulted in 51 deaths and massive damage. In response, the Netherlands passed the Zuider Zee Act in 1918 to close and reclaim the area. Construction began in 1920, and by 1932, the Afsluitdijk Dam transformed the Zuider Zee into a freshwater lake, benefiting agriculture and communities. However, a 1953 flood overwhelmed existing defenses, killing over 1,800 people, displacing 72,000, and causing extensive damage. This led to the North Sea Protection Works, including new dams and barriers. Today, the Netherlands relies on a mix of natural sand dunes, dikes, and locks to protect against storm surges and flooding. The Netherlands relies on a complex system of drainage ditches, canals, and pump stations, once powered by windmills, to keep its lowlands dry for living and farming. But what if all these barriers suddenly failed? The 1953 disaster gives us a glimpse of the potential devastation, lives lost, land flooded with saltwater, and cities wiped out. Some experts believe the real question isn't if the Netherlands will sink, but when. Dr. Kim Cohen's 2300 prediction shows Amsterdam, Utrecht, and Rotterdam underwater, with coastal dunes shrinking and the port of Rotterdam moving inland. There's even a Dutch website where you can see what would happen to your town if flood defenses failed. From 1945 to 1970, hydraulic engineers created barriers like windmills, canals, and dikes to protect the land, but in trying to control the sea, the Netherlands may have gone too far. The Netherlands, like much of Europe, faces regular summer droughts. Despite being below sea level, hot summers have reduced the Rhine's flow, a key freshwater source. As a result, the Dutch are now focused on conserving water. However, it's not easy, the government is hesitant to raise rates for large water users, fearing public backlash, and water use restrictions could anger farmers. Plus, limited space makes building large reservoirs difficult. Farmers and scientists are helping by reshaping the land to retain more water. In Inskeed, planners create uplands to trap rainwater and remove hard surfaces to expose porous ground. The Netherlands is doing all it can to save water, and the strategy is working. When the Netherlands faced concerns about feeding its population, it set a goal to double food production while reducing resource use. Despite its small size, about the size of Maryland, the country succeeded, becoming the world's second-largest agricultural exporter, after the US. This achievement was made possible even with frequent droughts and floods. The Dutch have pioneered innovations in cultivated meat, vertical farming, seed production, and robotics for milking and harvesting, while also focusing on water conservation and reducing carbon and methane emissions. Yet, traditional farming remains strong, with the country producing millions of cows, pigs, and chickens annually, making it Europe's largest meat exporter. The Netherlands' agricultural innovations benefit much of Western Europe, with 24,000 acres of greenhouses, double Manhattan size, powered by green energy, making it eco-friendly and modern. The country also leads the world with the first commercial seaweed farm inside a wind farm. Located on land with 139 wind turbines, this 12-acre farm aims to harvest 13,200 pounds of seaweed in its first year. Funded by a 1.5 million euro grant from North Sea Farmers, the farm highlights seaweed's potential. It's nutritious, versatile, used in packaging, feed, cosmetics, and medicine, and crucial for absorbing CO2, helping combat climate change globally. Not all Dutch projects go according to plan, as seen in the case of the unique nature reserve known as the Dutch Serengeti. Established as a sanctuary for deer, horses, and other wildlife, this expansive reserve covered 12,350 acres. In the beginning, the population flourished, growing to 5,230 animals thanks to mild winters. However, when a harsh winter arrived, the lack of food in the confined space caused a tragic outcome. More than 90% of the animals perished, many of them shot by the State Forest Service to prevent further suffering from starvation. The underlying issue was the absence of natural predators, like wolves, which led to uncontrolled reproduction and a strain on the park's resources. Ultimately, it became clear that human intervention was needed to address the crisis they had unintentionally created, 
offering a sobering reminder of the delicate balance required in nature. On a brighter note, the Netherlands continues to push boundaries with its innovative water-based solutions. In response to rising sea levels, floating homes have been developed, offering a smart way to utilize space while blending with the natural environment. These homes are part of the country's strategy to manage water resources efficiently. However, they do come with certain challenges, they must be anchored to the seabed or supported by columns, and their stability relies on balancing heavy items. For instance, to prevent tipping, a piano might require a counterweight of bricks on the opposite side. Despite these unique considerations, floating homes are equipped with electricity and all the amenities necessary for full-time living, making them just as functional as traditional houses.